I think it's better than to trust humanity and people than trust in a, for example, a being that may or not not be there that gives you free will but yet controls the universe. And yet the universe is so large and mass that we we don't even know how large it is. But so what? Somehow this one Earth was created by one being before the pretext of even creation itself. So well, you're absolutely right. I don't have the faintest idea how large the universe is. What? difference does that make? I'm just saying it's naive to believe in a single uh, being that controls the entire universe or our entire existence and yet gives us free will. It's kind of ironic. But if there is no God, what is your brain? A highly complex chemical reaction. Yeah. So there's no you that makes free decisions. There's a highly complex chemical reaction that determines what you do. And, you and that's what B.F. Skinner, the great reaction. atheistic psychologist at Harvard pointed out. If there is no God, reality is limited to matter and energy which means there is no me that makes a free decision. There's simply a complex biochemical reaction influenced by my environment that goes off and what you see me do is not something I have freely chosen to do, it's something I have to do because that's what my biochemical reaction has programmed me to do. Do you understand that or not? No, I understand that you have your brain is chemical has chemicals in it such as endorphins yeah. that cause your happiness, which allows you to feel happiness. Yes, it's chemi it's chemically based. It is. If you believe in God and you feel that, then you understand that with or without God, that's still going to happen. That's true. No. <laughs> without God, endorphins will go off, chemical reactions will happen, but there is no me. There is no me separate from my chemical reaction. Those chemical reactions make you up. Do I have a choice to hit the man or do I have to hit him because my biochemical reactions have programmed me to hit him? Your biochemical reactions don't program you to hit him. Oh, they don't. Then no. why do I hit him? Because you want to. Because I want to. Who is I? Your theoretical you wants to hit him. Who is I? Who is me? Your theoretical you. That's who it is. Good. <laughs> if there is no God, it's just theoretical. Me. Because so in reality, so if there is no God, so I'm just complex biochemical reactions. So my biochemical reactions teach me, hit him. So I hit him. So you ask, hey, Cliff, why'd you hit him? But and I say, because I had to. But under your pretext of this debate, you've just created an alternative universe in which does not exist. No. I'm living in the here and the now. And in the here and the now, in the real world that I live in, I can smack him I, I or I can take out my wallet and give him, my, give him money I, for I'm, food. I'm pretty sure you're not understanding what I just said. You're saying there's a me. There's a humanness to me that goes beyond my chemical reactions. And I've been consistently asking you, really? Yes, Where which, does my which, humanity come which, from which, if you're saying that my humanity is more than my biochemical reactions? Yes, which, but under your pretext of your debate, if you don't believe that you have the choice within your humanity without the God factor, then that is just an alternative universe in which does not exist. That is what I am saying. Yeah, now you're, you're, you've missed my argument. You're not listening to me. My argument is not there's an alternative universe. My argument is the real world that we live in right now. Atheism cannot explain that. There's no explanation for free will. Atheism says no God, which means reality is matter and energy. Fine. If that's all I am, if, if I believe that I'm just matter and energy, then there's not a me that decides to love him or hate him. There's a me that does whatever my biochemical reactions program me to do. Guys, it's called behaviorism, right? B.F. Skinner, Harvard, behaviorism, the school of psychology, very consistent with atheism. So it's not a huge leap to make to say that any time you have a creature, an organism that is able to experience something, and it is suffering, then that is 
morally bad or that is objectively bad. Like that's not a huge leap to make, right? Would you agree with that? Uh, I, in general, I would. Yeah. But watch out. And someone can sacrifice their life for you. Certainly. And I wouldn't say that's bad. Not they always. suffer for you, but but that's pretty good. Yeah. Sometimes, if somebody sacrifices their life for me or for another person, right, that is good. Yeah. Exactly. Not always, though. Not if, always. If they're sacrificing their life so that I can eat Cheerios in the morning, right. that's not necessarily a good thing. Excellent. Good point. Um, so I agree with you. I agree that there are times that a human can sacrifice his life and just completely nullify all of the good experiences he could have had and that could still be considered a good thing. Yes, sir. But for that to be the case, I would say that their action of sacrificing themselves would have to somehow, in general, increase the well-being of the people, or the increase the experience of everybody else. In the okay. Um, so are you, are you utilitarian um, in your ethics? I actually don't have a great understanding of utilitarianism, so maybe. I don't know. All right, well, if, if we define utilitarianism as the good is that which promotes the well-being of the largest number yeah. of people. Uh, that, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's pretty safe. Yeah. Okay. I'd say I'd, I'd, good. I'd sign up for that. Uh-huh. Um, okay, now, obviously, though, the question is, who defines what's the good for the majority of people? So, it's not... Okay, so, I, I think I see what you're saying. You're saying... Uh, the idea of well-being. Yes. What is well-being? Exactly. Um, exactly. That, that is something that's hard to define. I agree. Um, mm -hmm. You can feed a child candy every day in the morning. Great they're, point. They're completely enjoying it. They're yep. having a good time. Frost their teeth. They die 20 years ago. Yeah. Well, obesity. Yep. Get. If I'm an atheist and a moral relativist, I have to think about my positions on bashing gays, abortion, abusing innocent children, gassing Jews. And then, if I'm an atheist and consistent with my relativism, I have to say, but the opposite of whatever I hold to be good is equally good. Not necessarily. So, you can say there are objectively good experiences. Um, okay, so for example, uh, it's hard for a physician to say that this person is feeling pain. It's a subjective, subjective experience, right? When I, if I have back pain, I might be, nobody else could, might be able to see my back pain. They might right. be able to see with scans or something like that. But I can say, man, I'm experiencing really bad back pain. Yeah. This is really, really painful. Right. Um, and I don't think anybody could say that, well, that's just a, a, a subjective experience. I, if there was a doctor who said, well, I think that experiencing back pain is something that's good for everyone. Good. Uh, I think that maybe maybe he is psychopathic. Uh, uh -huh. He would still be wrong. Exactly. Okay. So your sense experience informs you that objective reality exists. And that's exactly what I'm trying to argue. Your moral experience demands there to be a god of some type. Why? If I go up to this guy, pull out a knife, and knife him to death, and you ask me, hey, Cliff, why'd you murder this guy? And I say, obviously, because of the color of his dark glasses, rims. Anybody who wears, you know, red rims on their dark glasses should be murdered. Exactly. You're not going to sit back and say, oh, that's cool, Cliff. I understand maybe, you know, it's your subjective opinion, so, you know, it's all relative. No, I don't think so. I think your moral experience is the same as mine, and you're going to say no. To murder the guy, because of his dark glasses, is absolutely, objectively evil. Yes, I would agree. Okay, now the only way there can be an objective moral is if there is some being outside of you and me and him who gives him value and me by murdering him am doing that which is absolutely evil. If the, because if there is no God, we're just cosmic accidents. Can we just deny objective morality then? God, I mean, if objective morality requires that being dictate what is objective morality, then why do we need objective? What's the, what's the, what's the practicality of having that Good. objective morality? The practicality of objective morality is it defines our experience best when I pull out a knife and knife him to death because of his red glasses. It is not, I don't think, I don't think it squares with your experience or your experience for me to knife him to death and you say, subjectively, Cliff, what you did is wrong, but I understand that subjectively for you, it was right. I don't think you can live that out. Well, but God is assigning the value that's subjective. <laughs> God is 
No. God if God created you with value, then for me to knife you is a de denial of your value. That's why it's but wrong. Only in God's opinion is wrong if I met your logic. Right. But because God created you for a purpose, you really do have innate, intrinsic value. It's not subjective value. It's not, hey, my African-American friend, because I'm a liberal, enlightened white man, you have just as much value as me. You see, that's trash. That's all subjective garbage. The question is, in reality, whether I'm a liberal, enlightened white guy or whether I'm a fascist KKK guy, do you have intrinsic value? And if there is no God, none of us have intrinsic value. But if there is a God who created you in his image for a purpose, then it's possible that he really does have innate value. Does that make any sense? It does, but what's the need for maintaining that each individual has intrinsic value? I still don't accept that premise. Good. You're, you're right. Right. I can't prove that. Right. What I'm appealing to is your moral experience. His moral experience. And I'm saying that that intuition is misinformed. Okay. I think. I okay. Think. Okay, but what you got to do just quickly is for me, uh, you got to read a little bit of Nietzsche, Sartre, and Camus. Right. Have you already done it? Kind of. Kind of, okay. Yeah. But you see, because Nietzsche is brilliant, Nietzsche pours scorn on all of his atheist buddies who right. say, there is no God, but we have an eight value, uh -huh. and justice really exists. Right. And he says, you guys are so cowardly, you're such a bunch of intellectual wimps and hypocrites, because you're not willing to take your atheism seriously and live it out. So you see, that's my own plea. My plea to you guys is, if you're an atheist, I respect that fact, well, I've got but it. live it okay. out. Okay. All right, but these other guys who right, were, right. and maybe you are, I don't know, whatever, well, this other guy was, this guy right here. Very right. kind, we had a great discussion, but he, very clearly, I'm an atheist, right. fine. But in the same way that you're gonna hold me to live out my faith in Christ, right. so I'm gonna hold you to live out your atheist. That's fair, that's a fair. fair? That's fair. Good. See, and then, you know what Camus said? Camus said, as an atheist, the only question that I've got to answer is, why not commit suicide? In other words, if life is meaningless, because there is no God, then obviously the question becomes, why suck wind? Why continue to live? It's not that you have to commit suicide, but you better seriously consider it as an option, because life is meaningless. I don't agree with that premise, that, that Nietzsche kind of argues that life is meaningless. Right. I think uh, the subjectively experiencing things and thinking and contemplating, reflecting, which is a uniquely human faculty. Great thing, point. That provides meaning for life, right? And so it's not that because there's no being dictating that there is intrinsic value for, for any one of us. That's not the the only consideration, I guess. Is there, it's reflecting on our, it's, it's the faculty that is uniquely human, reason and reflecting on our own experience, and <coughs> that provides a meaning to life, which I don't think Nietzsche would agree with, right? Okay, great point. So let me see, make sure I've understood you correctly. You say, Cliff, wait a second. I think it's intellectually consistent to say there is no God, but the reason that I have meaning is because I can self-reflect. Right. Right. Which is a, yeah, which is a uniquely human faculty. Uniquely human faculty. And we ought to do what we are, what is uniquely ours kind of thing. Okay, but how does, well, first of all, I got an issue with self-reflection. Okay. Right? I think you're absolutely right. We can obviously self-reflect, uh -huh. but that means we have a free will, right? Yeah, I don't necessarily agree with free will. I mean, I think that a lot of it is genetically predisposed, neurologically predisposed. A lot of our, uh, our faculties are based in neurological and genetic predisposition. So the qualm is, is that we can only attribute blame to someone else if there is a free will, right? Good point. But if you deny that there is a free will, then right. you can't necessarily blame another human being, which is exactly. ultimately what I want to maintain, I think. Okay, we good. Shouldn't, we shouldn't have to blame another person because they're subjectively experiencing something very different than we're experiencing. And But, but, but the point is, is that they never had a choice in the matter of what they're experiencing. They were born into it kind of thing. And so, okay. or at least so I think, yeah. Okay, why do I respect African Americans so highly? The reason that I have so much respect for African Americans is because of what happened in Rwanda, what happened in Bosnia with the Serbs, and the Croats, and the Bosnians. 
What happened in Czechia? You killed my grandpa. You murdered my sister. I'm after you, bud, and I'm going to put you six feet under. And what has the African-American done? The African-American has said, you, white folks, enslaved my grandma and grandpa. But instead of ethnic cleansing and wiping you off the face of the earth, I'm going to choose to forgive you. You see, tremendous example of free will. But that's sort of like that, that forgiveness, that, that forgiveness is just a, it, it's pragmatic. It's so that we can, we can continue to interact. But okay. I, I don't believe in like, I guess, true forgiveness because true forgiveness requires an element of free will that I don't agree with, that I, that I kind of deny, I guess. Okay, why do you deny free will? Well, because, I mean, I think we as a society don't have enough in from neuroscientific research to really inform whether or not we truly have free will. And on the premise that we are nothing more than what our brains kind of yeah. conjure up, which Good. is something that I maintain. And right. we can't even speak intelligently about it because right. we don't have enough research on it. Yeah. And so, but until we have enough neuroscientific research to say that, you know, that neuron X in my brain or or a part of my brain correlates with a certain action of mine right of which i don't have full control over in in many respects yeah. right because i was born with let's say elevated levels of a certain neurotransmitter or right. a certain predisposition in my brain to act however i do right yes and insofar as i was born that way and in many respects those levels are fluctuating all the time right, all right. i don't have direct control over that and insofar as I don't have direct control over that there's there's I don't have free will over that and free will is I think a requirement for blaming others which is a premise that which is is assumed at least by many of I guess world religions so I don't have a problem with it but uh, well not only is it assumed by that it's assumed by our legal system that too I completely agree if with that. I go walking around the corner of your Absolutely. building here and a professor's walking towards me right. with a little balding on his head, right. big stack of books under his arms. I haul back and hit your professor as hard as I can. Right. I'm hauled into a court of law. The judge says, hey, Cliff, why did you s smack that professor? And I say, well, your honor, when I was a little kid, my dad was a little balding, and every time he'd abuse me, he'd pick up a big book and hit me over the head. And when I saw that professor at the University of Arizona, he just so reminded me about my dad, I had to hit him. Right. The professor will say, the judge will say, Cliff, I'm sorry about your upbringing, right. the environment, uh -huh. but you are still responsible for hauling back and hitting that professor. What if the environment affected the neurology and the, right, which you would agree is beyond the control of the individual. I would agree that at the end of the day, we have to blame people for wrongs that they commit. I would say hold responsible. Hold, hold, excuse me, yeah, hold responsible. Hold responsible. But I think that just serves a purely pragmatic purpose. That's so that, <coughs> so that we can have some sort of order in the world. And I think that, you know, that is, I mean, the legal application is interesting, but I think that our philosophy of law is going to change with the expansion of our understanding of neuroscience. Sure. Yeah. And our study of psychopathic killers right. changes how we treat it and judge a psychopathic killer. But sir, I can promise you, if you murder someone, uh -huh. based on how you've been talking with me, uh -huh. I don't think you're mentally out of control. I think you're a very sane, rational person, and I will hold you responsible if you pull out a gun and blow him away. Right. I'll say, I'm sorry. I'm sure there were influences that affected that decision of genetic heredity and also environment, but I am convinced you have a free will. I'm convinced you did not have to blow him away. You chose to, and therefore I'm going to hold you responsible for your decision. And you how see, you, that's a big part of human dignity. I, I would agree with that, but how do you argue for that position then? I mean, that there is that element of freedom. Moral experience. Okay. Experience of self-reflection. Okay. But Tonight, what? on my bed, I'm going to sit and I'm going to say, when I responded to that student, that was rude. Okay. When I responded to that student, that was respectful. Right. Don't do that again, do that again. So my ability to know myself and to judge myself shows that I'm more than just a complex biochemical reaction. Okay. There's a me that can judge how I handled my instincts, okay. how I handled my drives, uh -huh. how I handled my drive for revenge. Mm -hmm. Did I seek revenge and carry it out or did I forgive? 
I'm responsible for that. And what if that moral experience, which you're, you're at least from what I'm understanding, is irreducible almost? What if that? What if we? What if our expansion of the sciences, the physical sciences, and neuroscience, and and you know these bio, What if it yes. can be reduced to purely biochemical reactions? Would your position then change that there? It at least is no. It, it, I'm not making the. I mean, the claim that there is no free will, at least free will, you would agree, would be devalued, right? For some our people. Our consent, okay. Okay, here, here's why I don't think that's going to happen. I am convinced if you give me a lobotomy, yeah. you can radically change my behavior. Right. All right? Right. So obviously, I do believe that the biochemical reactions in my brain are very important. It's a big part of who I am. Right. My simple point is, that's not the whole story. There is still a me that stands beyond the biochemical okay. that makes judgment calls. But who is that you? Who is exactly. That you that's a soul. Okay. That's me. That's, that's Cliff. That's you. See, right now, I don't think I'm talking to a bunch of chemicals. Yes, obviously you have chemicals. Obviously you have biochemical reactions. No question. So do I. But I'm convinced that there's a real you. And that's what I really enjoy connecting with. The real you. Vincent van Gogh, the great Dutch artist, grew up in a Christian home. His parents told him about the love and truth of Jesus Christ. And Vincent van Gogh put his faith in Christ as a young man. He was deeply committed to Christ, but then he started experiencing depression. And the deeper he sank into depression, the more cynical he began, became. And eventually, Vincent van Gogh walked away from his faith. His depression became incredibly destructive as he maimed himself. But then slowly and gradually, you begin to watch him moving out of that depression back to faith in Christ. Vincent van Gogh used the color yellow in his paintings to picture the light of God, the grace of God, the love of God. And it's fascinating to watch his artwork. His pictures began to include more and more yellow, more and more light, more and more joy. And it's fascinating that that color yellow that he used in his paintings represented for him the presence of Christ, the presence of God. And then in his painting, The Rising of Lazarus, he actually puts his head, his face, on the body of Lazarus. Depression, fear, anxiety, worry can make us retreat from life, can make us retreat from God. And yet that's sad. Instead, God calls us to trust in him and then to allow him to help us work through our depression, our fear, our anxieties, our worries. Too many people in America today think that the purpose of faith in God is to have God solve all my problems so that there's no more pain, no more suffering. No, that's incorrect. When you and I experience pain, the challenge is to ask ourselves, God, what are you trying to teach me in the midst of this pain, in the midst of this suffering? The challenge for you and for me as human beings is to work through our pain so that we can know Christ better. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, the Apostle Paul writes, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. The fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Do you understand? The all-powerful, eternal God humbled himself, became a human being, and suffered. Jesus experienced pain. And Peter writes that Jesus used pain to teach him to always obey the Father. You and I can experience pain. And when we experience pain, the challenge is, are we going to allow pain to wake us up to the deeper issues of life, or are we going to allow pain to drive us into depression, into bitterness, into anger, into resentment against God, into disappointment with God. When you read the book of Job, you're confronted by a man who experienced a ton of pain. And yes, he asked God hard questions. He asked all the why questions. Why, God, have you allowed this to happen to me? Why did this happen to me and not to somebody else? Why at this time and in this place? And God never answered one of Job's questions. But in the last four chapters of the book of Job, God comes to Job and starts asking Job questions like, where were you when the moon and the sun and the earth were created? And God gives Job a bigger vision of reality. 
God helps Job see how small we human beings are, how big God is. And if we think that we're going to be able to wrap our minds around all the difficult questions and have good solid answers, we are naive. There's a tremendous mystery to life, but God has given us minds so that we can begin to understand reality. Also, God gave Job a deep sense of his presence, his withness. And that, friends, is the best way to deal with pain, to embrace the presence of God and to allow God to go with us through our pain. That is exactly what Mother Teresa did. She was a woman of deep faith, but she also struggled with depression. She also struggled with the hiddenness of God, with the silence of God. But she held on to Christ. She kept on doing what she knew was right to help the poor in Calcutta, India and elsewhere. And as she continued to honor Christ with her life, she grew in faith. No, she did not always have overwhelming spiritual experiences. In fact, she struggled with real loneliness and real depression. But she held on to Christ and she allowed pain to be a teacher instead of a discourager. She allowed pain to refine her, to refine her faith. And that's exactly what Job did. For Job understood that his faith was not based on the circumstances of life. Instead, his faith was based on the character of God, which is good. Life is unfair. God is fair. Never get the two mixed up. Turn to a suffering God. Turn to Jesus Christ, for he can connect with you in your pain, in your anxiety, in your stress, in your depression, and he can pull you out and bring you joy and peace. God bless you as you put your faith in Jesus Christ. I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church. We meet every Sunday morning, 9.30 at Sachs Middle School in New Canaan, Connecticut. Take the Merritt Parkway to exit 37, go to the end of the ramp, take a left onto Route 124, go approximately one mile, and take a right into Sachs Middle School. I'd love to invite you to join us this Sunday, 9.30, for our worship service. Thanks for spending these few minutes with us. Have a great day.